Slancha, everybody. And I know it's not really so much the Cade Miliafalcha feeling out there, given, you know, <coughs> all that stuff. Here I am with some more video content for you, as the self-isolation is well underway. So since I technically am a quarter Irish, uh, I decided to celebrate my rich heritage by indulging in the worst representations of Irish heritage, probably in media. Uh, being a movie person and all that stuff, I decided to watch some pretty crappy movies that in one way, shape, or form were Irish-based. So I had myself a triple feature made up of two franchises that you might have heard of. I'll start off with my first feature, which was the only installment of this franchise I watched, which was 1993's classic horror, Leprechaun. It'd been a while since I'd seen Leprechaun, actually. Uh, I think about at least 12 or 15 years. And I just was curious to see like what I would pick up on now that I'm a little bit older and a little bit wiser. Not much, because there's not much to the movie. And it just plays in really bad slapstick, broad Irish stereotypes. The only thing that really kind of enlivens the proceedings is Warwick Davis's over-the-top energy that he pours into the Leprechaun character. And yes, as has been mentioned by plenty of people before me, this was the movie that predated Jennifer Aniston on Friends. It was one year before she got the Friends gig. So you can just ideally think of it as sort of the prequel to Friends, where instead of Rachel leaving Barry at the altar, Rachel just had a really weird, like, summer vacation. But just a little bit about Leprechaun that I didn't know before. I didn't know that this idea had been gestating with the director since, like, 1985. Uh, the director of this movie, apparently, he was originally a television director and wanted to break into features and felt that a straightforward horror horror movie would be the best access point for that. The original concept of Leprechaun was a little bit more earnest uh, in its darkness, I guess, and morbidity. It was a little bit more serious-minded, and it wasn't until he got Warwick Davis onto the project he saw what Warwick was doing with the role that he was like, okay, okay, let's have fun with this. Let's make this a stupid horror comedy. And it endeavors to do that. I won't say it's overly successful if you look at it uh, with regards to successful horror comedies, such as maybe the Evil Dead franchise. Warwick is by far, yeah, the highlight of the whole ordeal because he is throwing everything he can into this performance to make it larger than life, make it memorable. And it is memorable, if not just because you will have the Leprechaun's catchphrases stuck in your head because they're the most generic catchphrases that you could pro probably have in a Leprechaun-based horror movie. It's not nice to take gold from a Leprechaun. I needs me gold. You never heard of a Leprechaun before. Sorry, that was more of a Scottish accent, I guess. You know the story. People take his gold. He cuts a bloody path of destruction to get his gold back. Even if you don't have his gold, just assume you'll get killed because he, you're in the way of getting his, of him getting his gold. But they don't really do much with it after that. There's some cool lore building here and there with regards to like four leaf clovers or the leprechaun's kryptonite. He doesn't utilize his magical powers as much as you'd probably want him to. A supernatural creature, you'd want him to really be messing with people. He has like a rip off Friday, or not Friday, but Nightmare on Elm Street moment where he like sticks a miniature clawed hand through the phone a la Freddy's tongue in Nightmare on Elm Street, except for the fact that he is seemingly immortal and impervious to all kinds of harm. It'll slow him down a little bit, but it won't do him in. What else is there? Oh, we got Francis from Pee Wee's Big Adventures there, playing a big dummy. The little annoying kid from Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead talks like an adult in this one, more so than most of the adults. Some guy who doesn't look like Kevin Bacon <laughs> is playing kind of the lead hunk role. And then you got Jennifer Aniston, dear, dear Jennifer Aniston, looking for the finish line in this movie. Like, I, I kind of love her performance in the ironic sense, because you just kind of get the sense. And knowing where this movie places in her career, knowing that it's just a year away from her big, like, breakout into pop culture, you get the sense of she's just like, wow, I, I, I need this to be done so I can move on to something else. Now, I've heard like in the moment when she got cast that she was a relative unknown. I think she only had like a couple of TV show appearances under her belt at that point. She was kind of overwhelmed in the moment from what I heard on a Howard Stern like interview 
a couple years back, or I think it was last year actually, that she was kind of overwhelmed as a young actress at that point to be in something like this in a positive way. Like, oh my God, I get to work with a guy who, who was in Willow. That's kind of cool. This m movie is definitely sort of a, an omitted bit of history that she probably encourages. She doesn't do half bad for what she has to do in this movie, which is kind of play the Ripley to the Leprechaun's alien. She has one of the most memorable lines in the movie, which is, I don't think that was a fucking bear. <laughs> It's Leprechaun. My opinion on it really hasn't changed so much in the years that have passed between viewings. It was silly and dumb and I laughed out loud at it then. Uh, silly and dumb and I laughed out loud at it tonight. One thing I did pick up on though was the overuse of ADR in that movie. I, I didn't realize years ago like just how much ADR they had put into this movie to the point that it's kind of ridiculous. Like characters are constantly talking even as they're off screen or even as they're transitioning out of the frame. The talking never ceases and I have a feeling like if you were to take out a good 50% of that ADR there would actually be some pretty tense moments in this film. But it did provide for some some hilarity at a certain point. Not Kevin Bacon, Nathan had his leg caught in a bear trap at one point because the leprechaun set up a bear trap for him. That's how that works. They're in the barn or something and the leprechaun has like the little kid on the ropes. He's like about to kill him. The rest of the gang busts in. Francis Ozzy says, I have what you're looking for, come get me. He swallowed a piece of his gold because he's a dummy. And of course, Leprechaun's like, I need me gold. And so he chases after Francis. And as he's chasing after him, he passes by not Kevin Bacon and kicks him in the shin in his bad bear trap leg. And you hear the ADR line is like something to the effect of this one's for you, jackass or something on the way out of the barn. I don't know how I missed that line years ago, but something about it tonight just cracked me up. And yeah, there's some silly imagery in this when you consider the leprechaun is your main antagonist and is chasing you around screaming about his gold all the time. Kind of hilarious, but not too hilarious. Like a lot of the intentional jokes aren't funny. Jennifer Aniston is trying to do something and is coming up with nothing because there's not much to work with, I think, outside of just reacting to Warwick Davis as the leprechaun. Uh, she plays kind of this LA, LA brat from the 90s caricature. And I guess you could transition that into Rachel. And don't think that the marketing on this movie didn't try to do that, didn't try to play up the Jennifer Aniston-ness of it because any re-releases will feature her prominently. Warwick Davis and Jennifer Aniston, you know her. So that was Leprechaun. And like I said, I had another uh, franchise that I was following, this time two installments. It was originally just gonna be a double feature, but then I pulled the trigger on this one and said, ah, what the hell, let me see the sequel to this. The Boondock Saints, everybody. Confession time here. Back in college, when I was 19, 20 something years old, Boondock Saints was the dorm room jam. Everyone in my dorm loved that movie. I kind of got a little bit of a thrill from it. My friends and I would quote it nonstop. And now looking back on it years later, oh, college Mike. Silly, naive college Mike. Because not only is my evolution and growth past Boondock Saints appeal rooted in the fact that that style of storytelling just doesn't cut it for me anymore with regards to long lasting. But also I know knowing a little bit more about the background of this film colors my perspective on it to say the least. First things first, I will appreciate a do-it-yourself type of attitude from the writer and director Troy Duffy when it comes to he had a vision and he wanted to get that vision out there and so he fought tooth and nail and comprom you know and tried his best to compromise something that could make it possible. His sc original script I think at one point was six figures worth being passed around to different uh, studios as a potential blockbuster. Miramax uh, at one point, Weinstein gave him 15 million to get started there. Uh, but then apparently a lot of the success of his script before even shooting anything, before even getting a, a studio to back production, went to Troy's head and he became a little too big for his britches. There's a really good documentary uh, about him called Overnight, which really is actually with him in the trenches chronicling kind of his rise and his fall when it came to putting the Boondock Saints into production. His animosity towards Harvey Weinstein, I mean, in this day and age, watching the documentary, 
Do I have to root for any of those assholes at this point? No, I don't think so. Troy Duffy, story goes, he wrote this script kind of as a cathartic release for himself after witnessing the authorities like wheel out the body of a dead woman from a drug dealer's uh, apartment. And it just got to him like this idea of like the vigilantism and the indifference of good men, as it's said in the Moondock Saints. How can we sit back and let this happen to people? How can we not take out vengeance on the unrighteous, on the corrupt, and so forth? That was the genesis for his Boondock Saints script. And young 20-something me apparently loved that idea. Maybe you love more the idea that this relative nobody, this bouncer and bartender, was able to kind of scale into his dream job of writing and directing a film. Maybe more so that, because looking back on the film now, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty lame. <laughs> There are still some things I like about it. I will say this, whoever he gets as his director of photography, they know how to set up a shot. The actors he was able to finally bring onto the production, Willem Dafoe, Sean Patrick Flannery, Norman Reedus, Billy Connolly, they're all really good in the roles. Any and all appeal I get out of this dialogue, which is very, at times, on the nose dialogue, I'm getting out of it because of their performances. It's kind of the same way I get a lot out of Kevin Smith movies, is it's not so much the dialogue, perhaps, or the prose that he's constructing in the dialogue, it's more dependent on who's saying it. Like, Alan Rickman could be talking complete gibberish, but it's Alan Rickman, so I'll listen. Same goes for Willem Dafoe here primarily. In the first movie, Willem Dafoe is very much the character I enjoy watching just because it's Willem Dafoe going out there and as big as he can. His interactions with the Boston PD and the detectives on the case are my favorite part of the whole movie still to this day. Just their back and forths, how they work off each other. It works because it's Willem Dafoe and he's charismatic enough to kind of hold your attention even though the actual story and the actual actions are complete garbage. I wish I could say the same for Sean Patrick Flannery and uh, Norman Reedus. I like both actors. I've liked them before in previous stuff. This is well before Walking Dead fame, so Norman Reedus is coming into his own at this point in his career. Sean Patrick Flannery had, I think, Powder and a couple of other movies under his belt at this point, so he's pretty well established. And I, they're good at times. They just do a lot of yelling. <laughs> And that's not as compelling as what Willem Dafoe's doing. Willem Dafoe does his fair share of yelling too, but he varies it up a little bit with some snide comments here and there. In other words, I used to relate to the McManus brothers because I was in total bro mode. Now I relate to Willem Dafoe's character because I'm in total Dafoe mode. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Solange. <laughs> Boondock Saints. These days is more just of a larf for me. Something that gives me kind of a laugh now to think like, I can't believe I took this world and its characters so seriously back in the day. I can acknowledge technically what's going on is proficient enough. I think the slow-mo is a very good stylistic choice. It's done to death in the film. The film suffers from some more severe issues like its structure and its pacing. The constant flashing back, flashing forward to the cops investigating the crime scene the brothers just entered before fading to black. I guess I would consider it a guilty pleasure. I don't get the same genuine thrill out of it that I did when I first saw it because I've definitely mellowed and matured in my old age. It's still something that I find fascinating, especially now that I know a little bit behind the actual scenes what was going on with regards to this writer and director kept pushing and pushing for something and eventually just lost big and had to settle for a little indie studio that didn't even pay him out his royalties in full after home release of the movie like that i don't think that got settled until years later he him and the cast didn't get their actual like recompense until years after the film was out and it becomes sort of this big cult Hit. And I was gonna leave it at that. I was gonna leave it at the Boondock Saints, but then curiosity bit me and I'm like, hey, you know what? I never saw the sequel. So Boondock Saints 2, All Saints Day, The Saintening. Oh man. This was released, I think, what was it, 2009? Nine or 10 years after uh, Boondock Saints was released, and the reason for Boondock Saints limited, limited release partially was because it was going with a smaller studio that can only secure a couple of theaters, but also in part due to the fact it was released around the time 
of the Columbine shooting and dudes in black coats running around shooting people willy nilly probably doesn't fly so well post Columbine. Not saying that was wholly the reason why, probably because it's a crappy movie. <laughs> Years later, Duffy finally is able to put together his sequel that he's been kind of teasing and touting throughout a decade, which is Boondock Saints 2. Canonically, it takes place eight years after the events of Boondock Saints 1. The brothers have become shepherds with their dad, Billy Connolly, in the old country and are brought back because someone is imitating their kills except they're killing innocent people. So they have to come back and clear their names in some way, shape, or form or find out who's behind it. They recruit Clifton Collins Jr. I think he, it's pretty early in his career at this point. I could be wrong about that. He might have been in a lot of stuff prior, but it was the first time I'd ever become aware of Clifton Collins. Their new sidekick since their last one got killed. It also brings in Willem Dafoe's protege, Julie Benz, who you might know from Buffy and Angel, Darla. The highlights of this movie for me begin and kind of end with Julie Benz and Clifton Collins because I have a feeling they're fully aware of what they're involved in and they don't care. They are throwing all kinds of like, I'm gonna throw in this weird thing and I'm gonna throw in this weird thing. Clifton Collins is playing up the angry Mexican stereotype to the nth degree, but I mean, he, he's going for broke, so that's entertaining to watch whenever he puts on like really crazy eyes. Julie Benz is into this whole like Annie Oakley type of like affectation. She sells it. She is captivating to watch. I mean, not just because she is a beautiful woman, because her accent is like, I'm trying to pinpoint exactly what she's trying to do with her southern drawl type of accent. I'm trying to pinpoint all of her different like behaviors and clicks. Like she's an interesting performance to watch. I don't care about the characterizations of these new players so much, but they are just interesting to watch as performers. On the other hand, You've got the brothers, Flannery and Rita are back, and they look tired. And then you've got Billy, Billy Connolly. He's very tired. And then you have a little bit later, Peter Fonda, who is extremely tired to the point where I was kind of like, is his dialogue ADR? It's matching up perfectly with his voice, but there's something in his voice and something about his affect that isn't registering on the same level. Like his voice is exuding an energy that his face is not communicating right now. <laughs> so that was something to see just dead eyes in some of my favorite actors. An actual component of the story in All Saints Day that I enjoyed is the camaraderie that is developed between the trio of Boston cops and uh, Julie Benz. They do have like good rapport here and there. They they like, I, I do like sort of this four musketeers type of mentality they begin to develop around each other, kind of getting each other's backs so that the higher up feds don't try to disrupt their investigation and as secrets are revealed how they're led into those secrets. The performances there are very fine and there's actually some good comedic timing on the part of Julie Benz and these other uh, characters working off of each other so I'll give the movie that. That was an interesting part. That was definitely the part of those parts of the movie where I was more focused on it, where I wasn't kind of zoning out action scenes that again are doing their stylistic thing, but somehow it's not as interesting as it was in the first Boondock Saints. Like now it's like it's too polished. The action in All Saints Day just feels too polished now compared to what it was in the first movie where yeah it's stylistic and kind of neat visually, but you could tell like it's a first time director trying to figure out how to do intricate action scenes. Action wise, all Saints Day is a big, eh, whatever. Other story beat wise, it's a big, eh, whatever. It's much more of the same old, same old. The only thing I was there for was Clifton Collins Jr. and Julie Benz going for broke. So there you go. That was my fun St. Patty's Day, everybody. Hopefully this was entertained to hear me ramble on drunkenly about, uh, Irish films. I know I should actually probably watch actual, you know, films about... Irish heritage um, that's sincere and more meaningful perhaps, but you know what kind of channel I run here. I'm all about the guilty pleasures. I'm all about the nonsensical. I'm all about the lame and stupid. So there you go. The triumvirate of lame and stupid Irish representation in movies for St. Paddy's Day. I wish all of you good health, more to come.